This is Joel Kotkin. And this is Marshall Toplansky. And you're listening to the Feudal Future Podcast. Our society is being rapidly reduced to a feudal state, a process now being exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Millions of small businesses are near extinction. Millions more are losing their jobs, and many others will be stuck in the status of propertyless serfs. The big winners have been the expert class of the clerisy, and most of all, the tech oligarchs, who benefit as people rely more on algorithms than human relationships. With this, around the world, the middle class is becoming more squeezed than ever. And it's having profound economic, social, and spiritual implications. Here on the show, we're having conversations with business, government, and citizen leaders like you to get to the core of these issues and explore how we can work together to form a better future than the one we're headed towards. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Feudal Future Podcast. I'm Marshall Toplansky. I'm Joel Kotkin. And we are delighted to have with us Mike Lind. Mike is um, a very well-known academic and writer in America today. His new book, The New Class War, Saving Democracy from the Managerial Elite, could not be a more relevant topic to talk about today as we witness the strife uh, that manifested itself in Washington uh, last week. Um, Mike, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Well, let's, let's start off with um, a question really kind of that gets at the core of, of your book, which is the notion that what we're seeing here is really the play out of the struggle between working people and the working class and the managerial de- elite, which has increasingly controlled the economy and now and controls many of what we think of as democratic institutions how is that playing out and how is that relevant to what we saw in Washington the other day? Well, I follow the uh, ex-Trotskyist thinker, James Burnham, who became an early conservative, uh, whose uh, book, uh, The Managerial Revolution, argued that there was a new ruling class arising in, in Western societies uh, made up of managers and professionals who were displacing the old owner operators of, of firms which they managed themselves. Uh, and this group is not limited uh, to uh, corporate managers and private firms. It includes nonprofit managers, includes uh, government bureaucrats, uh, it includes military officers uh, as well. Uh, and the vast majority of these folks, and, and you and I belong to this uh, class, I call it the managerial overclass, uh, have access uh, by either bachelor's degrees or increasingly by graduate and professional degrees, uh, a group which is really the top 10% of the population in terms of uh, educational attainment, uh, but controls half of the wealth uh, with the remainder divided between the truly super rich uh, and and the bottom 90% of the population. At the same time, uh, only about a a third of the population has a bachelor's degree, even from a non-selective school. So somewhere between two thirds and uh, three quarters of the population, I define not as middle class, because I I think that's misleading, but as working class, they are wage earners. Uh, They have high school diplomas, maybe a little vocational uh, uh, licensing. Uh, They live from paycheck to paycheck. They don't have, you know, they're dependent on social insurance like social security and Medicare in their old age. Uh, And this group, which is quite diverse and divided amongst itself, it includes uh, old stock, uh, natives, it includes recent immigrants. Uh, so this, the working class, the proletariat to use Marx's terms, uh, is the overwhelming numerical majority in the United States and in all industrial societies. We call our societies capitalist societies, they're really proletarian societies with a minority of capitalists. Uh, and uh, so, so it's divided, I'm not saying it's a single force, <clears throat> but I think a lot of the rage that you see both on the right and on the left is the fact that institutions that used to connect the governing elites with uh, the vast majority of of working class people, like trade unions, like churches, which were much more powerful in the past, uh, like uh, 
local political machines. Uh, you know, a lot of them were corrupt courthouse gangs and small towns and urban political machines, but uh, they actually did represent local populations to some degree. Those have disintegrated. Uh, we are fewer private sector union members in the US today than under Herbert Hoover before Franklin Roosevelt took office. Uh, churches are declining because of long-term secularization uh, and the political parties are just brands which individual billionaires like Donald Trump can, can capture uh, or, or Michael Bloomberg, he tried to capture it, right? It never would have been possible when they were functioning federations of, of grassroots political organizations and uh, the void that this has created in the realms of political power, of economic power and of culture has been filled by institutions controlled by members of the college educated overclass by universities or the new church. They're much more important in life than in, in American life than, than uh, religious institutions at this point. Uh, the political parties, as I said, are essentially elite factions and, and labels uh, and even the media the uh, local media are withering away. Uh, so people are better informed about what's going on nationwide uh, than in their own cities, which contributes to national polarization. Is this um, going to get worse given the move now towards uh, deplatforming and, and censorship? Uh, are we, uh, will the, the effect be to, to chase, at least on the right, people into the increasingly sort of uh, unhinged institutions? Well, I think you have to distinguish two things. There are online media and opinion platforms, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, and, and of course, both of them banned Donald Trump after the Capitol riot on, on January 6th. Uh, I think because most of us in the educated overclass spend a lot of time online, we exaggerate how important this is in, in the lives of ordinary people. Uh, so if you, if a few charitable trusts did a study that showed that only about 22% of Americans are on Twitter, 20% uh, of those, about 4% of the U.S. population, are responsible for 80% of the tweets. And of course, Donald Trump was <laughs> <laughs> a large amount of that. Uh, so, so I'm not that worried about the censorship. Uh, working class Americans get their information chiefly from television and radio. They're, they're not online. And, and the online people tend to be younger, politically liberal, college educated. The thing that scares me and that should terrify all Americans is when they demonetize mm -hmm. your website, right? You know, when you, uh, uh, Kurt Schilling, the baseball player claims, I don't know if it's true or not, that AIG insurance refused to, uh, to reinsure him because he had pro-Trump tweets. So I think when this starts happening to you in the real economy uh -huh. and the consequences are not that you can't just say, oh, I hate Biden on Twitter, you know, but you can't get insurance, right? Your business is being blacklisted by banks and credit card companies. That is really, really frightening. So the power, the means of power really is economic, that the managerial elite controls most of the money and can more or less influence who gets it and who doesn't outside of the elite. Yeah, that's right. And this is, this is not necessarily the case. You know, for ec economic power can be controlled by, by a democratic government. Uh, if you go back a hundred years, the early electricity companies, like the holding company of Samuel Insel in Chicago, uh, you know, the water companies, things like that, these were essential infrastructure companies they were controlled by these plutocrats, you know, like, like you know, the, the tech titans of today, mm -hmm. incredibly abusive and, and corrupt. Through the New Deal, you know, the, the later generations, uh, slowly but surely, he uh, restrained these essential utilities by means of public utility regulations, you know, all sorts of other regulations, so that there, no individual tycoon of electricity or water is going to cut off my water electricity because of something I say on this podcast. But, you know, this, this, it could be canceled 
right? right. It will it will affect right. your they can affect your ability to make a living. And if you think about the working class and the rage that they're expressing, the idea that the managerial elite would say, look, in order to maintain earnings growth, we're going to outsource your jobs or we're going to put in a major um, automation program that will eliminate half the workforce. That's really what you're talking about, right? Yeah, and but, but I'm also talking about there are two kinds of power in a democracy. One kind is voting. You vote every few years. It's, it's largely ineffectual for most people because, you know, it's one vote out of, you know, 150 million or whatever. Uh, you may be in a safe district. Your vote doesn't count. But, you know, it's something, right? There's some degree of democratic accountability. But it is not adequate unless you have what uh, Bernard Crick, the British political scientist, called extra parliamentary organizations unions or like lobbies, or if you're a senior citizen, the AARP. And these organizations are there in the faces of elected officials between elections. Uh, and if working people do not have these, these lobbyists and these institutional representatives, and it can be the, you know, it can be civil rights uh, leaders who are church pastors, you know, it, it can be, uh, uh, you know, union leaders, it can be anybody unless they're in the faces of the politicians between elections, then you're going to do what the donors and lobbyists who are all part of this upper class are, you know, say. Uh, and then you'll simply, three weeks before the election, you know, you'll like go to Hojo's on your campaign bus, right? And, you know, eat, eat, eat some, some uh, you know, chili dogs or something. So, so again, it's not just about money. It's about power. Uh, and particularly, it... Uh, the, the three weapons of the working class historically have been vetoes because let's face it, you know, you're working most of the day. You don't have time to, you know, to organize uh, uh, in, in, except in your spare time. The three vetoes are the strike, which is the ultimate weapon in the economy if you're working class. Uh, it's the boycott if you're a consumer uh, and it's uh, uh, refusing to vote for a candidate refusing to reelect a candidate. Uh, and, but the only way these three working class vetoes work is if the working class is organized in disciplined uh, mass membership organizations, because individual working class people, the majority of Americans, uh, they don't have personal wealth they can bring you know, to bear on politicians. They don't have you know, prestige. They don't have celebrity. They don't have academic influence. They have numbers, uh, and unless those numbers are organized, they will be powerless, even if they can cast a vote every two years or four years. What about this? Uh, what I find really interesting, and, and, and the biggest change I've seen is in the past, you had, you had liberal companies, conservative companies, usually the CEOs, separate from their own organizations. In other words, you could have a, a, a corporate leader who's very conservative, but he has lots of progressives working for him or you have people who are um you know uh, leaders who who are who are progressive and they'd have conservatives and that seemed to be fine what i find really frightening is the rise of what i would call the woke corporation and is, is that a function of the power of the managerial elite and even a a particular part of the managerial elite over what has been the historic function of a company no, I think it, it's a result of the education of the managers. Uh, so, you know, basically, if you go back to the 90s, you know, uh, the people who worked in Wall Street firms had a totally different social, you know, background and culture and environment than, than the crazy long-haired professors. Uh, the journalists came from different background, often working class, and so on. You know, I remember being at the... Uh, the Harvard Club one time in, in the 1990s when this guy who looked like he was in high school uh, in the elevator next to me is telling his friend, he's like, well, I always like to take a man golfing to see if he'll fit into the firm, right? And so mm -hmm. <laughs> this is another world. Uh, that <laughs> collapsed because a few Ivy League schools and uh, selective state universities like my own, the University of Texas, have become the funnels 
uh, for more and more of the corporate and financial elite. In the old days, well, in the really old days, if you were J.P. Morgan's son, you ran the company. I mean, you know, you, you could have dropped out of high school. Then there was a period when the elite was very regionalized. So, for example, when I went to school in the 1980s in Texas, uh, there was no advantage in going to the Ivy League, you know, if in, in Texas business or finance in Houston or Dallas. You know, you went to the University of Texas or SMU. In fact, if you went to Yale or Princeton, you'd be kind of a weirdo. Oh. Georgia, you went to, you know, you know the local universities. Uh, we've got a much more nationalized, centralized elite. And you cannot, so the younger generation of managers, whatever their personal views, some of them may uh, disagree with it, but they learn in college that you all, you preemptively surrender to the left on social issues, not on economic issues. They're not left-wing economically. They don't like unions. They don't like taxes. But on race, on gender, on language, things like that. Environment. Yeah, environment. They, they learn this. Okay, I, whatever you want, we'll give it to them. Right? So I, so I think it has to do with the socialization of, of our managerial elite, which in a way is good. Because uh, I do not argue that the managerial elite has to be the way it is right now. In, in the United States in 2020, I mean, we had a managerial elite from the 1920s and 30s onwards. And, and you know, at different stages, it worked with the working class. It was patriotic, you know, it was, it was often socially conservative. Uh, so, you know, who knows what, so I'm, I'm not arguing that every single feature of today's managerial elite is a result of its position. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you should say that because as a um, business school professor, and MBA myself, I've seen kind of an evolution of MBA thinking. Yeah. When I was getting my MBA in the late 70s, um, the, the rationale for businesses was entirely economic at that time. There was very little social conscience or need to be, obviously there's a need to be ethical, but, but ethics were a function of doing a good job of making money for the, for the shareholder. And what we've seen over the past, I'd say, 20 years is actually a growing social conscience among top managers of businesses. Yes, there's still a ruthless pursuit of profit and maximizing profit, but there's a growing awareness among the managerial elite that it needs to be balanced with the broader needs of society. Are you seeing that yourself? I'm skeptical, and I'll tell you why. But first, let's go back into the history of this. Uh, the U.S. managerial class was always much more distant from the working class than it was in, say, Germany or Britain or so on because of ethnicity. Uh, uh, in the northern industrial cities, you know, uh, you had uh, European non-British immigrants were majority of the working class. And then you started having African-Americans and white Southerners uh, after the cutoff of European immigration, World War I, 1924. Uh, so uh, in, in countries like Germany, where the medieval guild craft tradition mm. gradually evolved into modern capitalism, uh, you didn't get this huge social divide, this, this group of managers and the workers. Uh, in fact, management is a, an American science, you know, uh, uh, going back to the 1900s. Uh, then on top of this, Marshall, what you got in the 50s was there was a transition from the founders of the great electromechanical industrial firms, you know, uh, you know Ford and, and Edison and so on. Uh, the, the initial founders, particularly in automobile industry and manufacturing, tended to be engineers by background. Uh, by the 50s and 60s, uh, they were succeeded by CFOs, by financial officers. And by the, the 70s, you got WR Grace, you got these financial holding companies where, where, you know, so the, the, they often attribute the idea of shareholder primacy to an essay in the Harvard Business Review by Michael Jensen. But in fact, the practice antedated that essay. You know, they were building these purely financial empires where the purpose of the company was to make money. And so you would just be a holding company and you would own, like, I think W.R. Grace owned Little Debbie snack cakes and exactly. restaurants. And yeah, I don't see, you know, as, as yeah. Harold Janine and that whole era of people, you know, figured out how to manage diverse assets. They, 
obviously extended it as much as they could. You're, you're right. But don't you think that there's been a substantive change since that era? Well, well Davos, you know, Aspen, you know, the, the, the business thought leaders, they're all talking about going back to shareholder or stakeholder rather responsibility away from narrow shareholder primacy right. to stakeholder primacy. And I'm of mixed opinion about that because if stakeholder primacy means you're paying off the local NGO, uh, you know, the environmental NGO or, you know, the anti-poverty NGO and your daughter and your niece run it and everyone in the NGO is a, you know, got a, a college diploma from an expensive liberal arts college and this is your social responsibility. It's like, okay, it may do some good, you know. To me, it gets back down to this question of power. You know, do you have works councils in your firm, even if you don't have unions, right? Is there, is there some consulting uh, power or, 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 or a, a, some kind of consultation with workers other than sending them to be disciplined by HR? And if they're not, then I'm afraid I'm skeptical. Then, then in that case, running a private despotism, you know, which could be a living hell for your workers. Uh, but, you know, you're giving to charity. I mean, so, okay, so you're like a Renaissance warlord. Yeah, so you feel better. This is you a, feel better, yeah. You yeah. give money to the Catholic Church. And the, thing sports, that, you know? the thing that I find frightening about the shareholder, um, the, the stakeholder capitalism is A, it sort of says we're not going to make the state the, 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 the Republic, the race publica, to take care of these things, we're going to take care of them. In other words, oh, we have a problem with the environment. Oh, let Tim Cook take care of it. We have a problem with political violence. We'll let Mark Zuckerberg take care of it. Um, you know, other words, that we're, we're, what I'm afraid of is as we assign to corporate power the role that government used to have, then the, the role of government as representing something other than the the oligarchy seems to um, fade in, in the distance. And I agree and with you entirely. I was at a, a conference sponsored by these big uh, donor foundations about a decade ago with all these international NGO people. And I was at a nonprofit think tank at the time, New America. Uh, and so somebody in the audience asked me, well, what do you think the role of NGOs in uh, international foreign policy should be? And I said, well, I co-founded an NGO. I don't think they should have any role in foreign policy. <laughs> Our role is to give advice to democratically elected policymakers who can be removed by voters uh, in, in the next election. But, but no, but they were seriously talking about giving a formal policymaking role to, uh, to nonprofits. Uh, and your point about you know, uh, fighting violence so in the last week, since the riots on Capitol Hill, uh, all of these people have been purged and prescribed from you know, Twitter and Facebook, right? Uh, Parler, which was a uh, rival to Twitter has been annihilated. The vast majority of people on Parler uh, or Parlay, you know, depending on how sophisticated you are, uh, you know, they're just ordinary moderate conservatives and Republicans. And they said, well, they were planning insurrection, right? Uh, now, up until last week, I had been under the illusion that we pay the salaries of the people at the FBI, the CIA, Homeland Security, ICE, state and local police, to monitor suspects, to thwart terrorist plots, and to arrest criminals. But now I find out that Spotify is in charge of doing this. <laughs> Spotify banned Donald Trump from sharing his favorite music. So, well, Shopify too. The, the Shopify. Shopify, maybe it was Shopify. <laughs> uh, playlist was politically un unacceptable. <laughs> the, 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 the thing that distinguishes modernity from feudalism was a distinction between public and private power. Right. Between the public realm and the private property of the, the the aristocrats and the king was just the first among equals, you know, among these aristocrats. And we need to be very worried about blurring the distinction between private and public power. But, you know, 
I wonder how much we're just kind of kidding ourselves. First of all, government historically doesn't get anything done efficiently. And half the time, in fact, many times in, in both foreign policy and domestic policy, have to hire the private sector as contractors, admittedly working under their guidelines and their, their regulations, but they have to hire private contractors to actually get anything done. So isn't the line inherently blurred anyway? No, I don't think so. I have nothing, uh, I, in fact, I'm in favor of contractors uh, carrying out specific government tasks. I think it makes much more sense to have companies compete, you know, to uh, repave a highway, right? And then go with, you know, the lowest bid or maybe, you know, the best track record rather than having a full-time salaried staff of highway pavers working for the county just in case a highway needs to be paved. I have no problem with that. If they're supervising it, I have no problem particularly with, with military contractors, uh, you know, as long as they're under the supervision of, of the mili civilian military, which is in trouble to civilian authority. But in the case of, of these uh, prescriptions, that's what I call them. I mean, they're internet prescriptions, digital prescriptions. Uh, the companies are deciding whom to ban, okay? It's not that somebody was charged with a specific crime under a law that already existed on the books, was tried before a jury of his or her peers and convicted, and then the company decides to boot you. They decide, well, we don't like the way you voted. We don't like something you said. You know, we, we just don't like the looks of you. You might be up to something. Yeah. And, and you're only, you have no power because the constitution that governs them in the absence of government regulation is their terms of service, which they themselves write and change and which nobody reads. And it's also, they claim some of them to be governed by a committee which they appoint. Right? So if the basic rule of constitutional government is you cannot be a judge in your own case, then that is just flouted uh, in, in this new tech sector. Now, but let me say again, this is within a certain industries, which Congress in its uh, infinite wisdom decided not to regulate in the 90s and 2000s. Uh, for example, in publishing, there's a very strict regime, regular publishing about libel and so on. You're, you're, uh, there's not because of section 230 of the 1996 Telecommunications Act. And we all remember uh, back in the 1990s, putting E in front of something was a get out of regulation, get out of taxation card. Okay. So Amazon, which looks like a book retailer, it's e-commerce. They can't be taxed, unlike brick and mortar stores, right? Uber looks like a taxi company, at least to me, but it's you know, like a digital you know, transport service. So I think that in the third decade of the 21st century, we, we, we really have to stop using the phrase tech and just describe these industries as what they are. Amazon is a retailer. Okay. Uber and Lyft are in transportation. Just drop the E, drop the cyber. Drop, and Lyft, is, I, I make fun of Uber and Lyft because people say they're tech companies because you call them on your iPhone. Okay, does that make Yellow Cab and Diamond Cab telephone companies? Right, of course not. They're, they're obviously... Taxi services with different ordering, different business ordering models. techniques, and same thing with with Amazon. Let me let me so so the solution there is to apply the same standards to the 21st century businesses as we would have to the 20th century businesses when it comes to regulation. That's my belief. Uh, in Monvie, Illinois, the famous uh, Supreme Court case in 1876 involving uh, uh, grain warehouses. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, if a company becomes uh, clothed in the public interest because of its indispensability to the economy, uh, uh, you know, and, and they drew on British presidents going back to wharves and, you know, toll bridges and so on. In that case, even though it's privately owned, the government can regulate it. Uh, historically, uh, in both in Britain and the U.S. and all the common law countries, uh, we have regulated these co companies that are clothed in the public interest under two rubrics. 
One is common carriers, right? Uh, you know, as a railroad, say, uh, you, under, under, with some specified exceptions, you basically first come, first serve. Whoever pays to put their cargo on your flatbeds, you have to take it. Uh, restaurants and hotels are pu public accommodations. Uh, you got willing customers, they got the money, you got to let them in. You know, they, and again, there's some exceptions, dress codes, things like that. Uh, I, I think if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That is this common law regulatory tradition. These categories of common carriers and public accommodations are sufficiently flexible. I would just assign Google, Amazon, you know, uh, these other companies to one or the other of the categories and, and just regulate them. Now, I would make an exception for the ones that publish people's opinions, uh, like Twitter and Facebook, because uh, to my mind, these are simply a weird kind of magazine. They're weird publishing companies. Classified advertising of the- But they would be covered on the publishing. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would strip away to section 230 uh, and immediately millions and millions of anonymous posters would discover that uh, editors are gonna read their posts before they put them up. Uh, and the lawyer, they may run things by the lawyers and so on. Uh, so now, now this is controversial uh, because these platforms uh, are largely run by liberal Democrats. But under my system, they would just be magazines, right? Twitter would be like the nation or salon. Uh, you know, they're, they're magazines. Uh, so who would lose out? Well, maybe a few YouTube influencers on, on, on YouTube, uh, but the main people who would lose out, it's not people who have something to say who can get published, right wing, left wing, or whatever. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Twitter. I have never encountered any difficulty, you know, getting, getting my views across, uh, uh, you know, through the internet. What you would do is, and I think it would be a good thing, you would destroy this culture of anonymity. I think this is profoundly corrosive in a democracy to allow people to publish uh, aliases where the, the company that publishes these people, let's say it's Darth Vader 36. Knows who that is. Has no idea who it is. You know, I mean, I've, I've worked for magazines, you know, much of my life, you know, uh, Joel has, you know, worked in the media. It's like no magazine would just publish an anonymous denunciation, right? You know, from Zorro, right? That was like under the door. Of course not. Uh, and then the claim is, oh, well, that would have a chilling effect on politics. No, it wouldn't. It would have a chilling effect on Bob the dentist, who's, who's really the internet troll skull crusher 57. And Bob the dentist is anonymous, not because he thinks that Homeland Security is going to drag him away and, and torture him. He doesn't want his wife and his kids and his neighbors to find out all of this vitriol he's, he's spewing. So this, this is a controversial view, I know, because you know people start talking about the Twitter and so on as the public square. Uh, but it's not a public square if 4% of the population provides 80% of the content. Right. I, it, to my mind, it's simply a deeply dysfunctional publishing company. Yeah, Tower well, of Babel. Well, what, 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 what do you see happening? You know, we now obviously have an administration. You know, we're you know, thankfully we're past you know the Trumpian insanity, but now we have an administration that, from everything I can see, is exactly hooked uh, up directly. You know, sort of a. Uh, a main line, the uh, uh, internet connection to the tech oligarchs in Wall Street. I mean, the, that entire administration is, you know, on the certainly on the economic side, um, is going to be very, you know, pro tech. So let's just say we go on with this. Where do you see this ending up in terms of of class and also in terms of of the you know what's left of the of political liberty? Well, in the short run, I do think you get a fusion of Silicon Valley, uh, Northern Wall Street, and uh, the Democratic Party to a much de greater degree than happened under Bill Clinton and Obama. And under Obama, there was like a Vulcan mind meld between, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, between Silicon Valley and the White House. It was just a revolving door. 
Uh, so I think that will, will get worse. Uh, at the same time, these coalitions of the two parties are in flux. Uh, you have uh, college educated whites, affluent whites, have been leaving the Republicans going into the Democratic Party. If you look at the victory in Georgia, that was to former Republican whites, right? It's like country club Republicans shifting to the Democrats. You know, the, the African American share of the vote uh, shrank, if, if, if I'm not mistaken. And at the same time, in, in the last two elections, even though most non-white groups vote for the Democrats, growing numbers of uh, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, and even uh, African Americans have been shifting to the Republican Party. So I think that this Democratic coalition, which temporarily uh, controls all three branches, I would be very surprised if they control all three after the 2024 elections, but we'll see. Uh, it, it's very unstable. Uh, and the only thing, and, and it is being destabilized and top heavy by uh, former Republican neoliberals and neoconservatives becoming Democrats. It's actually being gentrified, right? It, I mean, it's getting wider and more upscale. And there seems to be a reaction among the downscale non-white Democrats to this already. Well, now whether the Republicans can exploit this depends on whether they can free themselves from the dead hand of their libertarian donors, you know, and their, their old Reaganite mainstream conservative ideologues. But don't they also have to get rid of their tie to Donald Trump? Yeah, Trump is, is, a, is another problem, you know. What, you know, whether he ends up as a kind of Juan Peron figure <clears throat> where even people in his own party hate him and wish he would go away. Mm -hmm. And, and divides the opposition, you know, this, this remains to be seen, I don't know. Right. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this has been really, really fascinating and, and so much of history is left to be written here on this topic. Uh, it's gonna be a fascinating couple of years ahead. I hope we can have you on regularly to give us to your, uh, your wisdom. Well, thank you for having me. Go ahead. Thanks. Th thanks, Mike. Hi, this is Marshall Toplansky. And Joel Kotkin. And welcome to the Feudal Future podcast. If you're listening, it means you're interested in creating a better future, one that values diverse discussion and preserves opportunity for the middle and working classes. This is why we started the show, to bring together ideas and people that challenge the notion of a hierarchical, socially stagnant, and centrally programmed future. Maybe you've experienced the rising costs of home ownership, diminishing job prospects, or the burden of over-regulation and increasingly censorship. This is happening in cities everywhere, and we recognize the need for new action. For this reason, we created the Beyond Feudalism Facebook group, a place for you to connect and share resources with like-minded people. Here you'll be able to ask questions, network, and share your own stories and ideas on how we can bring opportunity and common sense back into our civil discourse and governance. Consider this a hub for all things feudal, where we'll be sharing insights from our recent Beyond Feudalism report with Chapman University, clips and highlights from the podcast, and links to related content on topics such as housing, education, energy, transportation, and entrepreneurship. Much of our focus has been so far on California, but we expect to see this work and apply this work to conditions around the world. Well, as you could probably tell, we're not too excited about the path we're currently on as a society, but we are hopeful for what's possible. And if we can better understand what's happening and build momentum to overcome the trends, so much the better. So we encourage you to join the Facebook group via the link below to get involved and keep up-to-date information on all new developments. And for more information, my new book, The Coming of Neo-Feudalism, outlines everything that's happening and where we need to change. The link to that is also in the show description.